I never realized that everyone else in the world could actually see sharp lines. To me, it was just sort of this fuzzy, colorful place. And so my brain learned to interpret the world initially through color. This is a story about Mark Twain and composition. And for those of you that have been watching the few other episodes um, or have been following for a while, you might know I'm really into literature. It really affects me. I, I read quite a bit. And usually before I go to a place, what I'll actually do is not look at pictures of the place, but I'll, I'll read about the place. And Mark Twain, uh, Samuel Clemens, you know, back in the day, um, before photography, he was actually a travel writer. And he would travel around to all these fabulous places. And he has all these amazing little short stories and books that he wrote about his travels because he would send them back in a weekly letters to the, to the newspapers that would publish them all over the U.S., what these places were like. And when I first got started with photography kind of seriously, um, I was going to Milan in the north of Italy. And I didn't know really anything about Milan other than it was Italian and kind of romantic. And I was super excited. Um, and I want to take photos there. And so I went and read what Mark Twain had written about the Duomo. And the passage that he wrote was absolutely amazing. It's, it's too long for me to quote right now. Um, so I'm going to add it in right here. What a wonder it is. So grand, so solemn, so vast, and yet so delicate, so airy, so graceful. A very world of solid weight, and yet it seems a delusion of frostwork that might vanish with a breath. The central one of its great five doors is bordered with a bas-relief of birds and fruits and beasts and insects, which have been so ingeniously carved out of the marble that they seem like living creatures. And the figures are so numerous and the design so complex that one might study it in a week without exhausting its interest. Everywhere that a niche or perch can be found in the enormous building, from summit to base, there's a marble statue, and every statue is a study in itself. Away above, on the lofty roof, rank on rank of carved and fretted spires spring high in the air, and through each their rich tracery one sees the sky beyond. Up on the roof, springing from the broad marble flagstones were the long files of spires looking very tall close at hand but diminishing in the distance we could see now that the statue on top of each was the size of a large man though they look like dolls from the street they say that the cathedral of milan is second only to saint peter's in rome I cannot understand how it could be second to anything made by human hands okay and now we're back we're back on the savannah so what I found is that when I went there, I really wanted to try to capture the Duomo in the way that he captured it with words. And I think that ultimately I failed. Um, you know, words and photos are just totally different kinds of things, but they both involve composition, don't they? Like the way you put words together and the way you put things together in a photo. I do think maybe I had a few good compositions, but this is actually very early. Uh, way before I was, um, you know, good with HDR or even that good with photography, frankly. So I felt like my photos were a, a pale comparison to Mark Twain's words. But something that I discovered there, and this is a trick that I've grown accustomed to, is I have my own kind of compositional trick that I do now. And I call it Trey's Rule of Thirds. By the way, I don't believe in the traditional rule of thirds. I believe in the rule of, of phi, which is close to the rule of thirds, the golden ratio. But this isn't about that. This is about Trey's rule of thirds. And in mine, I believe that the photo is spread into three parts. Okay? Actually, this is a two-part rule of thirds uh, theory. I'll just make it a law. I'm going to upgrade it right now to a law. Um, the bottom third, the middle third, and the top third should all be interesting. Okay, if your top two-thirds of the photo are awesome, like the most incredible sunset and like a, a meteor shower, you know, it could be like unicorns, dragons in the air, it could be everything. But in the, if the bottom third is boring, then the whole photo fails. So that's one thing to keep in mind with the rule of thirds. Now, in landscape shots, um, I like to have uh, three levels of depth. I like to have something that's very close to me. Uh, something that the viewer can feel like they can reach out and touch. 
I like to have a, a middle distance, something they feel like they could walk to or they, their mind could picture how long it would take them to, to get to that spot because I think that our brains have really not evolved very far from our time out here in the savanna. And when we look at a scene, we want to see fresh water, game trails, something close, medium, and far away, just to give us some kind of sense of scale or epicness of it all. Because when you look at a picture, really the first thing that happens is the person puts themselves into that scene. Like, what would it be like to stand there? It would be so awesome if I was there. That's a feeling you want people to have. And if you can explain depth to them in the way you compose your photo, it just makes their brain just automatically happier. So we started with a close third, something you could reach out and touch, a middle third that you could walk to, and then a distant third, which is way in the distance, something that gives a sense of scale, some kind of backdrop, almost like a matte painting in a sci-fi movie. So this is what I try to do with my, uh, with my photos. And I think I learned a lot about composing photos um, from meeting good writers like Mark Twain. So if I hadn't been doing that early in my career, I may not have come up with some of these other composi compositional tricks that I, I ended up um, working on and kind of adding to my art. Hey, Team Awesome. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started a little bit differently here. I want to maybe show you a little bit about what I was talking about, um, especially about Trey's Rule of Thirds. But first, let me start by showing you a few photos here. All right. These are photos that I took of the, um, of the Duomo. Now, I don't feel like these are great shots at all. I think they're kind of interesting, but I think just looking back on them, it's, it's so interesting to look and see how I started with HDR, or high dynamic range. And this is like one of my first HDR shots. I do kind of like it, and I super loved it at the time, although as time goes on, it kind of gets pushed further and further down my portfolio. Uh, it's kind of a funny story here, because I got in quite a bit of trouble for bringing it my tripod. You're not, you're not supposed to do that, but I think they stopped putting people in prison there for going to church the wrong way a long time ago. Um, and here's another view from the outside. Um, again, I made this one like kind of super dramatic, uh, but I feel like it's a little bit overwrought, but at least it's kind of a vision of the, uh, of the Duomo. And I'm happy that I at least um, tried, even though I feel like I tried and kind of failed a little bit. Uh, but it's all right. I can always go back and try to improve. <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about Trey's rule of thirds and a few photos that uh, kind of indicate this. And you'll see this um, now, I guess, in a lot of my photos. So you can kind of see in this photo how the bottom third is interesting, the middle third is interesting, and the top third is interesting. There's no kind of weak part of the photo, I feel like, at all. It all goes pretty well. By the way, I really like this photo. I love it so much. It's really one of my absolute favorites. And I guess juxtaposing this one and the one I just showed you is kind of nice for me to see that, hey, I'm, I'm making progress. <laughs> Um, yeah, I like this one. Let me show you some more uh, that indicate this rule. The law, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a really cool glacier in uh, Alaska. And again, in the distance, the top top third, uh, we have really nice lines and strong shapes of mountains. The middle third, of course, is the glacier. The bottom third are all these little icebergs. By the way, this is a handheld shot taken off the bow of a Disney cruise of all places. Um, you know, I was fronted by my family. They're like, Dad, let's go. We've had enough. I was like, just a minute, chillins. We've got to take a few more photos. Uh, this is in Tokyo. Uh, it's one of my favorite photos of Tokyo. You know, you don't see giant buildings or anything. I guess you do see a little bit in the top third. The middle third is just sort of like interesting complexity. And the bottom third is where that complexity gets simplified a little bit. You can actually see into some of the houses. Here's another good indicator of that law. Uh, the top third, of course, is the distant mountains that have their nice shapes. The middle third kind of tells the story that it's a river. And the bottom third is this uh, fisherman. And I don't know if you know much about these Coromont fishermen, but they're really interesting. You see, there's a bird there. It's a Coromont bird. And he ties a little string around his neck and sends him in to catch fish that are attracted to that light. The fish grabs, uh, or the fish uh, gets eaten by that that bird, but the bird can't swallow the big fish because it's, it can't get through the string in his throat, or wrapped around his throat. So then the, it's a little violent, but the, the fisherman reaches into his throat, pulls out the fish, and throws it in that basket behind him. Uh, 
uh, here in the near distance, the thing you feel like you can touch is the, uh, the close part of the wall. This is an ancient part of the Great Wall where the vegetation is taken over. The middle part of the photo kind of tells the story of the Great Wall, sets context for the whole scene. And the top has that nice, delicate gradation of colors. Um, here's one of Hong Kong. Now the top third is just sort of a, uh, an abstract, interesting area, I feel like. The middle third tells the story of the, the city. The bottom third kind of really pulls you and it makes you feel like you just walk down there through the forest. There's another one. Uh, this was sort of an accidental um, Trey's rule of thirds. I knew the bottom would be interesting with all the motion here in Grand Central Station. The middle third is probably one of my favorite parts with these you know, five amazing windows and the light coming through. And the top third is the accidental part. I didn't even notice till I processed this that there are all these constellations and, and drawings up there on top, which is really, really cool. Um, this is another good indication of that rule. In the bottom, we have something very close um, that's interesting, this rock. This is part of Death Valley, where these rocks mysteriously move across the desert. There's a few scientific ex explanations online if you want to look it up, or you can just wonder. I think wondering is kind of fun. Uh, the middle third is this mountain range. The top third is the moon. You know, it's so funny. I show this photo to people and they go, oh, I thought that was the sun. And I go, you, you did, but there's stars out. And then they realize that, oh, yeah. Uh, here's another one where absolutely every third of the photo is interesting. Top, middle, and bottom. Um, you know, picture that if I had like moved the camera back a little bit and like there was the railing there, or you know, there's like a water fountain or just something super lame that was big, it would really detract from the photo. Um, this is the last one that I'll show you. Um, in the distance, we have these amazing peaks of uh, uh, in Argentina and Patagonia. The middle has the glacier and kind of tells the story of the mountains. And then in close up, we have this little floating iceberg um, there in the frigid water. Cool. All right, well, let's work on a photo together and we're going to do something a little bit different here. All right, we're going to take quite a departure from our usual method. I want to work on this photo. You saw those wonderful elephants just kind of meandering behind me in the savanna. Um, well, here's a photo that I got not too far from there, and I want to do something really crazy to this photo. Okay, so let's just make it cray cray together. So the first thing left to do is, let me press G to kind of, I'm going to go pull that one over here into processing now. All right. You can see I took a bunch of different photos of this scene, by the way. Let me just click through them. Um, you see they go bright, medium, dark. That's because I do HDR. So it's kind of nice to take a bunch of different shots and then find one that you really want to work on. Okay. And I think I, of all of them, I, you know, I like a lot of them, but I think this one is my favorite. Okay. So let's jump over here to processing now. All right, and then we're gonna press D to go into the develop module. Okay, now what we're gonna do is try to make this look as awesome as we can here. You can see I've already made a few tweaks, which I'll just kind of quickly go over here. We increased the contrast, uh, which made it just a little bit more uh, chunky. Uh, we dropped down the highlights to kind of make that, see when the highlights are normal and the whites are normal, the sky is just kind of just white blown out. But as we bring these down, it, brings the, it makes the sky more blue. Um, we're going to pull up the shadows a little bit because the chunkiness of the contrast made it quite black in areas. So we're going to bring those up. Um, clarity looks pretty good here. I like what it's doing to the whole photo. Uh, vibrance is just bringing a little bit more color and life into it. Um, we haven't messed with anything else down here really at all. Uh, we might just tap on the noise reduction. There might be a little bit of noise in there, but I doubt it. Okay. Now, let me talk about why I want to spice up this photo. Um, primary reason, there's all my Steam announcements there, I should log out of Steam, it makes me want to go play games. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I don't like about this photo is just the plainness of the blue sky. Now, it's not a terrible thing, is it? It's alright. Okay, nothing wrong with just a plain blue sky, it's fine. But, I want to spice it up, okay? Not for the sake of it, just to make it more beautiful. So, we're going to crop in here, okay? Because I feel like there's a little too much, I feel like the elephants are too small. And that's one thing you have to watch out for in these landscape photos is that sometimes, you know, if you use a wide angle lens, you can get a little too wide and you kind of can lose one of the most interesting things about the photo, which in this case is the elephants. Okay, so I'm going to crop it like this. 
Um, one thing I don't love about this crop is how I kind of cut this elephant's head off, but we're gonna, we're gonna fix that, okay? So I'll press enter here to crop it down like that. And now we're gonna go edit this in Photoshop, okay? Basically, let me tell you what we're gonna do and, and why we're gonna do it before we get it done, okay? We're gonna add a feeling to this photo that is more like a painting, okay? Just a big, beautiful painting that's as epic as we deserve. Oh no, I don't wanna improve Adobe products. Oh my goodness, Adobe. Let me get back to what we're trying to do here. Now, we want to make this um, a timeless kind of piece, make it much more epic, because to me, these elephants feel so epic. They feel timeless, and I want to do something that pays tribute to them. And we're going to do this by making it look a lot like a painting. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add a lot of textures to it. Okay, so this is a little bit of a texture tutorial. All right, we have a much bigger texture tutorial that we actually sell as a standalone tutorial over on stuckincustoms.com. Um, but this will give you a little amuse-bouche and you can see if you are interested in it, okay? Now, if we go here into Photoshop, you can see we have our photo here, all right? Now, before we add our textures, let's fix this elephant head, okay? I'm gonna zoom in here. I'll press J to pick this Content Aware Fill tool, okay? And I'll just kind of paint over this guy and he kind of goes away all right elephants in the mist he's gone okay just like that now let's find some textures to put on this son of a gun okay i'm going to jump over to adobe bridge okay this is where um, i use this is what i use to keep track of a lot of my stuff and let's go over here into my textures you can see we have a lot of textures here let's make these a little bit smaller and you know if you do end up, um, or if you already have that that textures tutorial, then you have access to all these uh, textures, about 150 of them, and they're really they're really cool. Let me make a few of a big screen just here to show you. Um, these are textures that I've collected all over the world, um, including a lot of textures that I got even um, in Africa. And you can mix and match these textures in different ways to do all kinds of different magical things to your photos. All right. We'll, we'll pick a few here and, uh, and bring them in, all right? Um, so let's grab uh, this one. Um, let's get this one. Uh, this one might be interesting. Let's grab that one. This one I really want to bring in. This is actually um, a zoom in of one of the elephants that was there, okay? The elephant skin. And let's pick maybe, I don't know. Maybe we're going a little overkill here, but that's okay. Just having fun, just experimenting. Let's get this one. Bam. Okay. So now that we have those, I'm going to click and drag them over here into Photoshop and drop them in. Okay. Drop them like they're hot. There's lots of ways to uh, to bring all this stuff in, uh, but this is just one of them. Okay. So it's going to pop them in one at a time here. I'm going to press Enter on each one of them. Now all these textures are super high res. They're actually like eight or nine thousand pixels across. But as you can see, they're not totally covering up the photo, are they? That's because they'll automatically readjust themselves um, to the, the shortest of sides, which in this case is the vertical. All right. We're going to have to do this thing called rasterize them, okay? Don't ask me what this word means, rasterize, but it just means that we're able to uh, manipulate it because they come in as something called a smart object, which we're not going to deal with now. So I guess rasterize just kind of means make them dumb. I feel like I rasterize myself a lot. Now what I want to do is go ahead and make them nice and big so they cover up the whole shoot and match. Okay, so I'm going to move them down like this. You can see I have them all selected. Um, then we're going to transform them and just drag the corner up so it's just bigger than it needs to be. Then I'll press enter. Okay. And it's going to uh, transform all of them. Now, here is the key trick that we're working on here. All right, let me show you, whoops. Bring this up. Now you can see that we only have one of these layers um, on, okay, but we can put it on and off, on and off. Now, if we go up here and we look at the blend mode, you see it's on normal. But if I go change it to something like overlay, you can see that it has combined these two into one, okay? Kind of gives it that sort of, that sort of look like that, all right? 
There's many different modes you can use. Um, soft light does one effect. Hard light does another effect. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Kind of nice. So let's just try it with another one. Let's go try um, this one. Okay. I love this paint dripping down here. What we're going to do here is go choose this one, Overlay, and just see some of these cool effects it does. Isn't that nice? So interesting. Okay. Now, I'm going to get a little bit complex here, so I apologize. I'm going to show you kind of like the full Monty of this technique. And, uh, there's a lot to it, so don't be intimidated. It goes a little bit slower um, in that other tutorial. But what we're going to do is adjust the opacity of this, because you can see as I move this up and down, it makes the effect stronger and stronger. But the idea is that maybe we want it strong in some places and weak in others. Okay, So we're going to do this thing called a layer mask. I'm going to pick a mask and a brush. Okay, We'll set the brush to maybe to 30% to make it nice and big. And everywhere where we feel like the effect is too strong, like some of these drips down here, so we can get rid of that. I do like some of the motion up here, but still maybe it's a little bit too strong. So I'm just kind of painting and covering it up. But you see the sky is already has this really nice kind of texture on it. It's starting to feel a little bit like a painting, isn't it? Okay, cool, good. So then if you look over here at this kind of gray mess we just made, we just kind of blended these two together. All right, let's flip on um, this one, a mounting of gold, okay. And let's go ahead and make it, uh, let's see what overlay looks like. Okay, you don't ever know. Whoa, that's kind of cool. Let's look at hard light. Hmm, interesting. Let's go back here to overlay. And see this giant crack here? Let's get rid of that giant crack. Each of these textures you can completely manipulate, of course. Uh, to get rid of the crack, I'll go in here. I'll just pick that content aware tool. And I'll just kind of paint along the crack, more or less. Okay, I have a little bit of a wide brush, so I have a, a margin for error. Uh, sometimes I like to use a Wacom tablet. In this case, I'm not. I'm just sort of using the touchpad. Um, so that's good enough. So then I let go. Most of that crack will be um, gotten rid of, I believe. Now I might go over some of the other contrasty parts. See, there you go. It's gone, just like that. Cool. Okay, so now let's go back to overlay. You'll notice that some of those really extreme cracks sometimes, um, or the contrasty parts, really pull away, so you don't want to do too much of it. Let's go ahead and lower the total opacity here a little bit, because I can see even at its strongest, it's too much. Um, boy, look at that sky. Isn't that pretty? Okay, so I'm going to uh, make another layer mask here, brush, and then go over some of the parts that I feel like are a little too strong. Okay. We're getting a little bit of painterly feeling down here in the trees and everywhere. It's kind of carrying all over, which I like. Good. Okay. Now let's add the elephant texture here. Okay. Oops, I didn't quite stretch that one the right way. So let me stretch it extra big, put it right in the middle. Okay, good. Now let's take this one and let's look at um, soft light. Okay. And let's just lower it down quite low. But I think just having this overall elephant feel will be subtle and it'll hit people sort of on a subconscious level like that. Perfect. We won't do any adjustments here because I don't think any, any I don't see anything too extreme here. All right. Now let's go to this one, uh, Blunder Blood. And we'll go here to overlay. Let's see what this looks like. Whoa, it's pretty extreme, isn't it? Let's go to soft light. Hmm. Not sure I like it, um, but we can do this one thing that's kind of cool. Let me go back to normal here and show you what we're going to do. I don't know if this will work, we're just experimenting. Uh, but we can actually change the color of this whole thing, okay? One thing about my textures I think that's pretty unique is they're all quite colorful. And of course, depending on the photo that you, you match them with, it, um, it changes the effect. So here, let's go to hue saturation. And we have this button here, or this slider called Hue. And you can see that as I move this around, we can actually change the color of this whole thing. Okay, we can, even, we can make it whatever we want to, which is pretty cool. Don't you wish you could do that with your walls in your house? You could just have a slider and change it so easily. Maybe someday. Okay, so let's put it back to normal. And I'll say, okay. And then let's change this mode back to overlay, I guess. And let's start playing with the, the color. First, let's make it just a little less extreme because I can already tell you it's too much. So we'll pull up, pull up this hue saturation, 
which by the way is command U, sort of a nice hot key if you like to do this quite a bit. And then as I move this around, you'll just see the, the whole tone and texture of the whole uh, painting is changing. Okay, I do kind of like it in these, some of these blue zones here. Not too blue, but just sort of a, maybe a bit more of a romantic blue. And we can go ahead and darken the whole thing too here a little bit. Yeah, okay. Now it's, it's much too strong. Okay, so we're gonna hit pick the brush here and really start dialing it back. Um, these trees down here in the water. Some of that texture just came out a little bit too strong, I feel like. Oops, I went the wrong way here. Let me lower the opacity of the whole thing there. Good, let me go back here. Yeah, everywhere those strokes are too small, we'll dial it back a little bit. Okay, very nice. Cool, cool, cool. All right, and then let's take this bottom one again, and let's uh, let's add it back in. And you'll notice that there's a very different effect depending on where it is in the order. So now it's here on the bottom. If I move it up to the top, it changes it just a little bit, doesn't it? Okay, so bring that in. I like some of these warmer tones. We're gonna bring back in. There we go. And that's um, that's looking pretty pretty nice. So then we'll shift here and combine them all into one, and now we have one final photo to rule them all. Let's go back and look at the, um, the original, which was here in Lightroom. Actually, let's just go ahead and reset the whole thing. Okay, so we, we started with this, all right, and then we ended up with that. Very cool. Let me show you a few other texture -y type photos so you can kind of get the, the idea of what's happening here. Um, let's start off, here I'll show you something kind of unplanned, is that I've actually, um, done that photo before, that one you just saw. Um, that was my second time doing it. Let me show you my other interpretation of it, okay, which is up here in Best Texture Photos. If I click here, and we have that. And you can see this is another version of that same photo you can get if you do a, a slightly different um, set of textures and mix them a different way. In this one, I picked one with a few more cracks in it. You can see some of these cracks in here and the kind of final result that came out of it. Very cool. Um, let me show you some other examples of textures. All right, let me go down here. Let's click on our, our through their rich tracery. And let's look at a few more examples, okay. Um, this is um, a really nice uh, texturized version of a tree in Lake Hawea, which is about two hours away from me. And I think it was a good photo without the texture. I think that's a fairly important thing to say, that is that it should be a pretty good photo without the texture. Texture can just be additive. You know, it's kind of like a, a good relationship, you know. You, <laughs> hopefully things are all right with you and you kind of generally like yourself and you find yourself a total joy to be around at all times. And then when you actually get into a relationship with another texture, it adds to you. It adds to your existing awesomeness. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is photo editing and relationship canceling here, okay. Here's uh, uh, these awesome horses in Yellowstone. Um, decided to amp it up there a little bit. This is a famous barn in the Grand Tetons, and I really like the texture here. One reason I did do it here is because there's this whole empty area in the top left that I felt could use a little oomph. It felt unbalanced. Um, this is at the Taj Mahal. Um, sometimes I feel like this, this texture treatment really gives things a classical, timeless feel. Um, this is another place in India. This is a Rodin sculpture in Paris. Um, this is my friend Jessa in Austin. And you can see how the textures kind of made these cool um, street lights or these uh, car lights that were passing by. This is a lonely tree in Argentina. Um, this is kind of a quick job, but it does give things sort of a nice special feel, doesn't it? This is kind of a dark texture treatment, isn't it? Yeah, I do like the way this one turned up. This is a tree in Yellowstone, sort of on a misty morning. I do like these warm tones. I find I end up going more warm than anything else. This is another part of Yellowstone where the textures have, have given it sort of a nice feel. Um, this is at Burning Man. This is quite a dark, heavy texture treatment. I usually don't go quite this heavy, but um, you know, in this case I did. Uh, this is an old town called Feng Huang in the south of China. I felt like this gave a sort of a classic old Chinese painting style. And I'll leave you with this one, which is one of my favorite photos that I've taken at Burning Man. Um, 
and I, you know, I came out of that sandstorm and it was so romantic and the basic photo by itself was great, but I feel like the texturized version of it really added um, something nice and romantic and a, a good feel for it. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I threw a few surprises there at you, uh, some new ideas. I hope your head is spinning and I really hope you try out this method because it's super fun. You always get something different and, you know, just like life, it can be a, a wonderful surprise for you. There's this wonderful thought that when you see someone that looks unusual or different or in a weird outfit or an unusual outfit or a wonderful outfit, whatever it is, you don't take a picture of what the person looks like, but you take a picture of who they are.